Parsimony is a principle of economy in explanatory systems, famously attributed to William of Ockham, who said that in an explanatory system, you should not multiply entities beyond necessity. The phrasing there is unfortunate, and it has often been misinterpreted to apply to the ontology of physical theories. When this was not the point, it is not how parsimony ought to be applied. Every physical theory should have an ontology and a dynamics. The ontology is the list of things that exists in the world of that theory. Dynamics, of course, are the behaviors of those things. Parsimony applies to neither. Why theories are useful, why explanations are useful, is that you move from the simple to the complex, explaining the complex in terms of the simple. So if your theory ends up arriving at a complex ontology from simple premises, from simple axioms, that's actually a good thing. We don't want to avoid ontologies that are um, large in extent. We don't want to irrationally favor a small uh, scope of ontology. Um, parsimony applies to the principles used in explanation. For an analogy, you know, you wouldn't prefer someone else's theory of geometry over Euclid's if they simply didn't cover as many proofs and demonstrations and didn't deal with, you know, conics, they didn't deal with uh, solids, they kept it to like squares and triangles. And they said, this is the real geometry. Uh, that's not a more parsimonious account of geometry, that's just a more limited account with less explanatory power. Um, instead, you could prefer another theory of geometry that worked from fewer axioms and spun out to have as much explanatory power. With parsimony, you want to do the most with the least. For whatever reason, this is a very common error in thinking regarding parsimony. People think that it applies to the things that are said to exist in a theory, but it applies to the explanatory principles, the axioms of the theory. Many people want to reject any kind of multiverse on the basis of parsimony. But when they do that, they are misapplying the principle of parsimony. Um, Max Tegmark, you know, is someone who wants to reduce physical phenomena to mathematical structures. He says that physical systems can best be characterized by mathematical equations. As we zoom in on reality and describe physical systems in the maximum amount of detail, we end up getting to ones and zeros. We get to uh, mathematical descriptions. So anything else that we add on top of those mathematical systems that is supposedly the physicalness of physical systems is ill-defined and doesn't actually offer additional explanatory power. And so on the basis of parsimony, Tegmark says, well then, there isn't this separate category of physical things in addition to mathematical things. Physical systems are just, uh, or rather physical systems that we observe are just a subset of mathematical structures. And then he can have a very small set of axioms because someone who wants to have a physical theory that distinguishes itself from mathematical structures will also have to explain math. So rather than having to explain two different kinds of thing, physical things, mathematical things, Tegmark can reduce the first principles of his 
kind of theory of everything to the laws of logic. And I don't see a problem with this. Um, if you buy Max Tegmark's mathematical multiverse, um, you are actually selecting probably one of the most parsimonious theories you could. Um, it's not intuitive to people. It's not obvious because it strains common sense. Uh, this brings me to a video that Keith Woods put out recently where he attacked multiverse theories uh, on the basis mainly of parsimony. And I do think he was misapplying parsimony, as is very common, so I don't blame Keith, Keith for that. But, um, yeah, let me just go through the points that he made in his video. So he starts by saying that if you explain uh, our universe with a multiverse, you're really just putting a deeper set of laws under the laws of this universe that then you have to explain anyway. Um, this is in the context of the fine-tuning argument, the idea that the physical constants, like the strength of the force of gravity, the weak for you know, the strengths of the relative forces, um, the inflation rate of the cosmos, things like this, are so precisely defined that if you changed them just a little bit, the universe would be totally um, uninhabitable. Stars wouldn't form, planets wouldn't form, life would be utterly impossible. Um, this has been used as an argument by theists to justify the idea of a creator, because then the creator could uh, dial in those fine tunings and get a habitable universe. Um, whereas if it was just up to chance, then it would, it would very uh, rarely happen that we got a, a habitable universe. Why the alternative would be chance is uh, not clear. I think when you start invoking randomness uh, in your theory as an explanatory principle, that is evidence of a defect in the theory. But anyway, um, randis, randomness can show up as a property in the dynamics, but if it's an explanatory principle, that's a problem. In any case, uh, people have responded to this theistic argument of fine-tuning with a multiverse model. Because if all the different possible physical laws and physical constants are out there, you know, as different species of mathematical structure, let's say, then of course life will exist. And of course, we as life will only find ourselves in one of those mathematical structures that is uh, hospitable to life. So we use the anthropic principle to explain fine-tuning with the multiverse. And that, in fact, does work as an explanation. But Keith was saying that it then invites further questions and makes the picture more complex. I'm going to try to clear that up. So, um, yeah, his objection was that if you posit a multiverse underlying our universe, a kind of uh, universe generator underlying our universe, then why was the universe generator uh, structured such that it led to the fine-tuning of the physical constants or a universe that was hospitable to life in the first place? Well, if the multiverse generator um, or the universe generator is simply the laws of logic and math, if the universe reduces to logos, then you don't have this problem because as it stands, even just with one universe, we still have to explain math. We still have to explain the existence of logic. So if somehow you can reduce the physical laws to that thing that we already have to explain anyway, then again, you're moving in the direction of parsimony, not away from it. Hopefully that's clear. Um, so then his parsimony point in particular, he basically lists different things that are involved in a, an account of a multiverse and uh, says that this is a larger list than a single universe, and so it's less parsimonious. So he says a multiverse involves every possible universe on the one hand, which again is this ontology of the theory, not the principles used in explanation. Universal laws, which of course also have to be explained even if there's only one universe. The universe generator, which, okay, would have to be explained, but if we're reducing physical laws to mathematical laws, then the universe, universe generator is just math, 
And again, we've cleaned up our theory a little bit and made it more parsimonious. Um, he adds that there's also the way in which those laws relate to every possible universe. And we can answer this very simply by saying that uh, those universal laws as laws of logic constitute every possible universe and are the substrate of more complex permutations of logic. So it's not like these are separate things. Simple logical principles just compound to produce complex logical structures. And those amount to the individual possible universes at the largest scales. The relation between universal laws and the metaverse is actually the same as what I just said. And then he says it also involves the relation of the many universes to the metaverse or universe generator. Again, this is a reductionist account that reduces the existence of those many universes to the principles of the metaverse using his terminology, which is simply the laws of logic and math. And then the meta-meta universe that contains the above, but because of the way that this mathematical reductionist account uh, fits things together and identifies things that don't need to be conceptually separated, ultimately, that there isn't a good justification for the conceptual distinction. Because of that, this idea that you need some largest set containing all of that um, doesn't hold. If anything, you know, the one, the platonic one, is that containing principle of the logical laws and all of their permutations, um, which I think Keith wouldn't object to anyway. You also need, um, in an account of a single universe, to explain why that one universe gets spat out at the end. You know, why not some other formulation of the physical constants? At least with a traditional, like, personal theistic or dualist theistic account of fine-tuning, you get to say that the creator chose the best universe, uh, the one that would uh, harbor life, because, well, he's the kind of being that's able to do that. But if God for you, like in classical theism, is just being, or if you're a Platonist and you believe in kind of impersonal one behind everything or a you know, perennialist divinity absolute, then it's really not clear how that force reduces um, you know, creation to one particular universe. And also, if you're a non-dualist, that one universe, like... <laughs> What are you saying there? Is that the same thing as the one? Okay, well, if it ultimately is the one, then it can't be conditioned by particular physical laws, and so you have to throw out the idea of uh, fine-tuning again. If reality is fundamentally one, if you're a non-dualist, then you can't have one particular created universe with one particular set of physical laws and physical constants. They're incompatible positions. So I don't really know how Keith sees um, his view as responding to fine-tuning. He was saying that the multiverse offers additional problems and seems less parsimonious. Again, I think that's because he's kind of misunderstanding parsimony. Not his fault. It's a very common misconception. And then he asks a couple questions like, why don't basically crazy things happen? Like, why don't planets suddenly appear and disappear? Because if we're in the multiverse, anything exists whatsoever. And so why do we find ourselves in a stable universe? But again, if we just return to this, you know, math structures reality idea, borrowing from Tegmark and ultimately from Pythagoras, then we're going to say that, you know, it's not that literally anything happens in the multiverse. It's that mathematically consistent, you know, law-like structures um, emerge of necessity. Uh, not like aleatory, random, chaotic structures, but mathematically ordered structures. The Logos pervades everything. And then the last objection that he raised was the idea of Boltzmann brains, which is that like under the laws of quantum mechanics, um, if you're going to have 
like the possibility of particles popping in and out of existence. Occasionally, particles will pop into existence together in a particular configuration. And if you run the probability of that happening to get all of the aspects of a working brain experiencing some simulated world, then a sheer probability under a multiverse should uh, hypothetically lead to many Boltzmann brain universes that are empty except for uh, these brains that for a millisecond pop into existence out of the void uh, from this kind of quantum foam substrate. And, uh, you know, I have a way of incorporating actually ideas like that into my own view, um, which deals with the limits of a world, what exactly constitutes one particular world. Um, for me, a world is observer dependent. And so Really, if the Boltzmann brain has identical experiences to the experience that I'm having right now on this hammock, then it's not two separate things. Um, the external appearance of that brain would only be intelligible if there was an observer there to look at it. And then the appearance, the external appearance of the Boltzmann brain is a distinct world from the subject of experience of that Boltzmann brain and of myself. But if they're truly identical, the Boltzmann brain and I, then there, we're not talking about two different worlds. And if you're an idealist and the world is affordances to consciousness, then that subjective side is identical. Um, and just the idea of like a universe only containing such and such a structure, I think, you know, is not hitting on the idea of the unity of a world um, as we might possibly conceive of it, even from a Platonist perspective, where you know matter, body, is suspended from soul. You know, you wouldn't have a universe unless there were observers in it. John Wheeler um, has similar ideas. Chris Langan has had similar ideas. Reality is in some sense observer dependent. And so this kind of random fluctuation uh, generating brains just doesn't really have to be an issue. That leads, uh, you, you get to that from materialist starting points, not from idealist starting points. So if something about math is akin to the nature of soul, then all of this fits together and you know wraps up very nicely. And in fact, that is the way it works in classical Platonism, in Plato himself, the world soul in the Timaeus is made from mathematical ratios. And so the substance of the soul is mathematical. That's also the case in integrated information theory, the leading, in my opinion, modern theory of consciousness. So anyway, um, yeah, positing many worlds, even if they're not observable at the moment, is not necessarily uh, unparsimonious. If you have a simple set of axioms that leads to a multiverse as a conclusion, then you have not violated parsimony. And I will also say that if you say there is one universe and it was fine-tuned somehow by some intelligent process to arrive at this result, then does that intelligent process also, does that intelligence also have knowledge of other possible states the universe could be in? Because if it fine-tuned the one universe, it did that as a selection as opposed to others. And if, you know, God with omniscience has exhaustive knowledge both of the actual fine-tuned universe and the myriad possible universes that he knows but does not actually create, well, what exactly is the difference between the actual and the possible? If you're an idealist, if you're an information reductionalist, then again, reality is affordances to consciousness. And if everything in the possible worlds is afforded to the mind of God, then what exactly sets the actual worlds apart? Might be a little bit of a difficult point, but you know, even for a dualist theist, if God has omniscience and he knows 
everything about every possible world. He knows everything about every possible soul. What can the actual worlds in question, the actual souls in question, uh, have that the possible worlds don't for God? If you're saying that God has to create to do something additional in order to have perfect omniscience, then God is contingent and God is not eternal because he requires some kind of differentiating act to differentiate the possible from the actual. I just think those sorts of modal distinctions are absurd when applied to um, the absolute or to an absolute intelligence. Um, so those are my basic objections. I didn't want to make this too long. Um, I'd be more than glad to talk to Keith about this. Um, or maybe we could just go back and forth and comments a little bit. I already commented on his last video, um, to make that last point that I just did. If you think I'm wrong here, um, explain how usually when people reject a multiverse, it is really on the basis of a hunch and intuition that that just can't be right, you know, but observationally speaking, the case would be identical, whether there's a multiverse or not. So really, we have to choose whether to adhere to the idea of the multiverse on the basis of an overarching theory, and we ought to select our theory on the basis of its parsimony in the true sense, meaning the simplicity of its principles and its explanatory power. And um, there is a chance that multiverse theories will have explanatory power. There's, in fact, ways of integrating observations of quantum mechanics with, for example, the inflationary Big Bang cosmology. Tegmark has talked about stuff like this, um, where, okay, if observers are finite and there are infinitely many causally disconnected universes, then those finite observers don't actually exist in separate instantiations. It's one and the same observer in a superposition across these many different worlds. So you, you know, you can integrate many worlds interpretation and inflationary cosmology. And of course, those are both compatible with Tegmark's ultimate mathematical reductionist uh, account, which I think is the best account. Now, there's a kind of middle ground here um, where you can say that not it's not literally every mathematical structure that comes into being, but only the mathematical structures that are guided into their development by kind of teleological principles at the same time. So there is room for a kind of tuning, but, uh, and this is, you know, similar to the way that Leibniz handles the question. He says there is one best of all possible world, uh, all possible worlds, because there is one best God and he creates the one best world. But at the same time, Leibniz says, and that world is not only the best, but also the greatest possible in scope. So there's no reason why Leibniz would reject the idea of causally disconnected bubble universes as an inflationary cosmology, or even the idea of branching timelines. Because those branching timelines, you know, according to just mainstream quantum mechanics, aren't actually totally parallel. They do interact. You know, David Deutsch, the inventor of quantum computing, believes in the many worlds interpretation. And he says that quantum computing doesn't make sense unless you posit many worlds. So there are possible explanatory advantages to positing uh, these multiverses. But anyway, it's all very abstract for most people and hard to follow. And so most people want to just go with their gut and say, no, it's just the one world. Well, you know, the multiverse, you can call it the one universe and just say it's much, much larger than we're used to considering, which has always been the way it's gone historically, right? We, we had this tiny little scope of what the world was in tribal society. It's just our land and then the outlying chaos. And then it's just this planet and the spheres. And then it's the solar system and the other solar systems in the galaxy. And then there are many galaxies. And so I, I just don't see, you know, why it should be counterintuitive even to say that outside of this one Big Bang event, if you buy the idea of the Big Bang, there could be infinitely many other Big Bang events. You know, you've already bought all of the explanatory principles necessary 
to get one universe. And now that you have those explanatory principles, you might as well keep using them to generate new universes. There's no reason not to. It doesn't violate parsimony. And in fact, if you uh, decide to stop arbitrarily with the one like observable universe that we see, then you're going to require a terminal condition. Like, why does reality end here? That actually requires an additional explanatory principle. Whereas if you leave it unbounded, that's less explanatory work you then have to do. So personally, I just think people's confu thinking on this is very muddled and not just unintelligent, like very intelligent people have muddled thinking on this. And, you know, you can see that from like the conversations that Max Tegmark has had with really intelligent people who just don't fundamentally don't get why Tegmark would opt for a theory like his. But I would recommend Max Tegmark's book, Mathematical Universe. It's uh, actually very readable. I listened to it on Audible and, uh, you know, the flow was pretty good. Um, but anyway, let me know what you guys think. If anyone, wants to, if anyone wants to discuss this, tell me I'm wrong. I'm fine with that. We can have the discussion. So thank you guys for listening. God bless.